Okay, the hour of five o'clock having arrived. I'm going to call the regular, I'm sorry, I'm going to call the public hearing of the Sherman Village Board of Trustees uh, regarding the fiscal year 2021 budget to order. And would the clerk please call the roll? Trustee Gray? Yes. Trustee Hahn? Yes. Trustee Long? Yes. Trustee Rockford? Yes. Trustee Schultz? Trustee Tim? Yes. Yes. That is. Six members of the village board answering the roll. Quorum being established. We'll proceed with the order of business as set forth on the agenda. Um, for the record, today is Tuesday, July 21st of 2020. We are at the village hall located at 401 St. John's Drive in Sherman, Illinois. Again, the time is 5 p.m. as posted on the agenda. It's a public hearing regarding the fiscal year 2021 budget. The budget document has been uh, made available at Village Hall. A budget meeting, a special budget meeting. There were several budget meetings that were set in association with this uh, fiscal year 21 budget. We had, had had to cancel a couple of them last week due to some circumstances outside of our control. Uh, that all being said, we had a meeting last evening uh, good members of the board was here. Brett will get uh, brought up to speed uh, as we proceed through this meeting. But I think we covered a lot of ground. It was about a four hour meeting, correct? Yes. Right at it. Three hours and 15 minutes. We literally went through each and every single line item. We talked about the <laughs> revenues. Obviously, the, st the start of any budget starts with available revenues. So we projected revenues. We looked at the various different line items, the potential losses that will be associated with such a U.S. recession, which the U.S. economy is in, the global pandemic, which has been affecting U.S. markets <coughs> and the U.S. economy, and how that translates into village revenues, local government distributed fund. We went into that deeply. Sales tax number, we're going to shore that up a little bit better in terms of the final real numbers. That is our largest line item source. The local government distributed funds are our second largest line item source, which is going to see a 10.23% fall off for fiscal year 21 in association with the uh, using the estimated projected projections from the Illinois Municipal League. So they have made those projections. They're very good at what they do. That relates to a $46,000 budget loss in that line item. Um, we did go through every single, each and every single expenditure line item as situated in the budget as presented. There are not any large increases in terms of year over year expenditures. We did talk about some areas that we could potentially find savings, but the problem with the village <coughs> budget is, is that the savings don't amount to a lot of money because there's just really no areas to cut. There's no bloat in our budget. It goes to salaries. It goes to people that make this operation go around. The police department, public works department, um, and the equipment that we use, which I think everybody would agree is probably I'm not going to say substandard, but I'm trying to think about what I'm looking for, but we don't have enough equipment. We don't have enough headcount, you know, to get the job done uh, where we would like to be. But that all being said, it's amazing what these guys and our staff is able to do, given the budget parameters. But going forward, in this budget, building permits are falling off 50%. Uh, gaming revenues are falling off. And those are sources of revenue that supplement our budget, but our two largest line items are the income tax and are the and is the uh, sales tax line item. So when you have a $446,000, uh, $447,000 line item for the local government distributed fund, it's gonna get a $46,000 hit and it's gonna drop to 400,000 and then sales tax is gonna come in around 600,000. Um, that's the, the bulk of our, our, our revenues. So. It was, we're being frugal, we're going through the budget. Trustee Holmes, just to bring you up to speed, some of the 
some, you know, some of the items that we looked at. We're not going to do clean up day this year. It's already been postponed and put on hold, and I think everybody was already under the assumption that wasn't going to take place. But even at that, that's about a $3,700, $3,700 to maybe $5,000 cost to the village. So while it's a savings, it's not substantial when you talk about just going up against the loss in revenues regarding one line of line item source of 46,000. The recycling program has become a big issue at the library. It's getting very costly to the village. I think the numbers last night actually that we talked about and that were shown on there are under, um, under the actuals. When I was down in Village Hall administrative offices after that meeting last night, uh, Kathy Nadino, who works for the village, she does a lot of our administrative work in putting the, uh, you know, making up the warrants and paying the bills and all of the legwork that it takes to, to run the village. But she actually showed me the bill regarding how many times that dumpster is getting dumped. dumped. And while it's a great program and it's helping the environment and it's a nice resource for people to have to be able to go dump their cardboard for free at that location. We're also seeing a lot of issues with it. One, that people aren't breaking down the boxes. So that's costing us money because it fills the dumpsters up a lot faster. <clears throat> when it's overflowing, these boxes are literally either falling on the ground or when it dump, the truck is dumping it, they're falling out. So every time that they have to get out of the truck, throw the boxes back in there and dump it, we get charged if it's a special call out, it's $58.99. And if it's a regular dump, it's what, $24.99, something like that, $23.99, or something along those lines. <clears throat> but even aside from that, one of the other issues is, is the fact that we've kind of been studying <clears throat> the labels on the boxes. And a lot of the boxes are people from other communities that are coming here and using it. And again, it's good to recycle. Nobody wants to stop recycling. But as we all talked, individuals in the audience um, and board members, a lot of people pay for curbside recycling anyway, and that's a part of their billing that takes place from their trash hauler now. So when we're talking about tougher and tighter budget years, slowdowns in revenues due to pandemics, due to recessions, due to lots of other issues, you know, at some point the onus comes back on the individual to take care of that. And so that's a four or six, maybe eight, ten thousand uh, dollar. I know the bill last night was a thousand dollars for for the previous month. Um, so if, let's just say if we annualize that, it could be you know twelve thousand dollars, which is a big hit to our somewhat smaller budget. Um, <clears throat> so we found some savings, but it's not nothing to. Minim mitigate and minimize the impact of forty-six thousand dollars plus another however many tens and tens of top tens of thousands in the sales tax line item. So I think we've got a good budget we can move forward on in that respect. It's not final. That's what this meeting is: is to kind of continue to keep working through it. We got through the sewer revenue fund budget essentially last night. We got through the motor fuel tax uh, budget. GRF was already wrapped up. <clears throat> so. One of the things that I wanted to focus on this evening is our TIF budget and the TIF revenues and the TIF issues and situations that are associated with our three different TIF districts. I briefly uh, started talking about it last, last night. So we have three different TIF districts in the village of Sherman as annotated on this map over here. You got the blue, which is the original TIF, the yellow, which is the Route 66 TIF, and the green area is the Rail Point TIF. The blue area is known as the original TIF. That was established in 1987. It had a 23 initial, a 23 year initial life on it. We got it extended in 2009 through an act of the General Assembly, of which I worked with uh, the board and I worked with the uh, school district. We came up with a plan to where we felt we were all winners in doing that. It allowed us to bring in county market. It allowed us to bring in Walgreens. It allowed us to bring in fire and ale the Lion High Bank Community Center, and it's helped grow our budget. Because like we said last night, can you imagine where we'd be if we did not have the revenues coming in from county market? 
eight million, nine million dollars that that generates, and the one percent, you know, we're getting off of that. If it's food and drug but consumed off premises, we <coughs> were commodities that are certain, you know, bought there that are taxed at the higher amount now. We get our one and a half percent. <coughs> so that tip's been extended. There could be the possibility of extending it, putting an extension on an extension, and making it a 47-year TIF, but the school district's opposed to that. I have four pieces of legislation introduced in the General Assembly right now that would extend all of these TIFs. Um, one's an omnibus bill that includes all of the TIFs together, and the other three are the individual TIFs in and of themselves. The school district is not for that, and it would take getting them and several of the other taxing bodies on board in order to extend that. Um, and so we're not going to find common ground on that extension. As much as we want to, as much as I would love to see that happen, it's just not going to happen. It was incorporated into their uh, referendum that they passed, the bond issuance for the new buildings and the, the facilities that they're going to build. So that, you can pretty much take that off the table. It's, it's a pipe dream at this point, and we don't want to disrupt their operations. <clears throat> we're partners with the school district. So let's go to the Route 66 TIF. Route 66 TIF, it was established in 1999. It is uh, in its initial infancy, life of it, life of it, 23 years. It started in uh, 1999, it's gonna end next year, 2021, and then close out revenues come in from 2022. Uh, that being said, there, in my conversations with the superintendent, they're not, supportive of extending that tip at this point. It's not off the table, but it's it's a it's a it's a steeper hill to climb for them because it does generate some revenues. But those revenues are insufficient to pay back the bonds that are issued in that area. So you know the school district, I mean it's gonna be it's harder to, to get that one extended at this point. Um, but you know, I have been talking with some school board members, I've been talking with the, the superintendent, and echoing our sentiments of how important it is to try and have economic development in Sherman, and that means business, create businesses, businesses that generate sales tax, so that we don't have to have a high property tax burden, which we went through last night in that pie chart you saw, we're the third lowest on that, that tax bill. We don't get hardly anything from a property tax payer when it comes to their property tax bills, but we're held accountable for a whole lot of things, whether it's, you know, things the police department have to do, public work has to do, administration has to do, all of these various different things. People just assume they live in Sherman, they pay all these taxes, and they think it comes to us. They think it comes to, you know, from the police department. They think it comes to fund the public works department. They think it comes to, you know, the administration, and that's, you know, just get my stop signs or, you know, do the various different things. And that is not the case. We're so dependent on sales tax revenue. And that's fine, but that's why we got to expand our sales tax base through the formation of new businesses. And how are we going to do that? Not many people are going to take a chance on Sherman. We have a better chance, but entrepreneurs, people making a huge, large capital investment in Sherman, still looking for offsets in terms of incentives. And we've been looked and bypassed on numerous different projects, and projects that we couldn't, that would have been great for the town, multi-million dollar projects that could have came to fruition, even with the TIFs being here, but the fact that they're at the end of their life, there was not enough time left on those TIFs to actually uh, offer a significant enough rebate, incentive, whatever you want to call it, for that project to pull the trigger. Multi-million dollar you know, gas station convenience stores that would turn lots of dollars around and put money into our general fund. Four, three years, four years left on that when we were talking about it, or even the six years was still not enough. So trying to convince uh, the other taxing bodies that we need this, this is good for all of us. If our town has got you know a good economic base, business base, it's good for the how you know all the individuals that live in the school district. It's good for all of our citizens. It's just good all around. And so trying to get that everybody to realize and, and come to that gray area that's not so quantifiable as well. We're going to you know potentially lose uh, these property tax revenues if you know that keeps going or whatever. But the flip side of that is you know it's the but for argument. If you don't have it, you can't lose it. 
So Route 66 is in the works, but I'm not going to give it a uh, 51% you know, uh, probability. I'm not going to go over 80%. Uh, so let's go to the rail point tip. The rail point tip, obviously everybody knows where that is. In front of the rail, it's where our new park is. Um, and there's a remaining 25 acres that are situated there. So that tip is set to it. That, that was started in 1999 as well. And it's just ironic that they're all going to end at the same time, even with the other TIF being established in 1987 um, and, and getting the 12-year extent, extension. So Rail Point TIF is supposed to end next year as well. It's our desire, I think, the board, and uh, definitely mine, and I had these conversations to extend that TIF. School district's much more receptive to extending that TIF. They see the benefits of that TIF. There's no revenues essentially being generated there, so you can't lose what you don't have. There's no redevelopment agreements that are uh, sitting out there that are committed against anything right now. So it's almost like starting from scratch, right? So that begs the question, do we let it die off and do a new TIF? Establish a new one and get 23 years where we have a better probability of bringing a business in and having the property tax revenues that they're gonna pay and be able to rebate a portion of them to bring some decent sized projects into that area, or to go for the 12 year extension and work off of that and then try to bring those businesses in. And so that's where I'm at, and you know that's what the, some of the conversations that have been taking place with myself and Superintendent Reed. But I will tell you that there, there's a high probability that they would be on board for extending that TIF, knowing that, you know, what the current status of the economic climate is, knowing the need for that, and knowing uh, what's what's already been started down there and the good things that can happen from that. So let's get to why we're here though. So that lays the groundwork and the basis for why we're even talking about this. So with this TIF expiring, we have to go on the, the assumption that it's not going to get extended. With that being said, any contiguous TIFs and any dollars that are in the TIFs are transferable from one to the other. So if they touch, they can support the other. That's how we were able to bring County Market in. That's how we were able to bring Walgreens in. That's how we were able to do a lot of things. We transferred monies from the original TIF into the Route 66 TIF. That gave County Market an incentive to actually pull the trigger on Sherman instead of waiting five, seven, ten years down the line when our population numbers grew and stuff like that. So they, you know, they got their incentive, they moved forward, and it was 435,000. Um, but we had the revenues there to give them 200,000 up front and then pay them back over a period of time. Same with Walgreens, I think it was a $190,000 inducement, made them pull, got them to pull the trigger. So we got to talk about the, ex the expiration of this TIF. The revenues that sit within our TIFs um, can and should be used to try and foster economic development to the best of our ability. And so I believe, and I hope all of you do as well, but I believe like, and I can point to it as a tangible thing that you can see, that the creation of our park and utilizing the TIF dollars there actually brought farm credit services to that area. When I negotiated with, and when we, but when I sat with uh, Larry Ellinger and Farm Credit Services was looking for a location and it was competitive, <coughs> and we made our best case why they should locate their headquarters here, because they consolidated their Lincoln branch and their <coughs> far out west branch into one building. And they looked at different locations. They looked at Springfield, they looked at uh, Lincoln, they looked at even our north end of town and a few other areas. But the one selling factor, the one thing that brought Farm Credit Services headquarters and consolidation to this area was the actual park plans. The fact that that park was going in, the fact that there was plans for a um, 10 feet wide, one mile walking path all around it, pavilions, gazebos, all of that stuff. And, I, and Larry will sign an affidavit to that and tell you that yes, that is why we, we loved that location. Right there was beautiful open green space, all of that stuff. So why stop now in terms of you know keeping the park going and trying to enhance the area and bring more people to the area, right? So bring patrons there so that it's easier 
for a business to see the daily traffic counts that are higher, twice as high on the south end of Sherman as they are on the north end of Sherman. So it's like, and these are outdated numbers, but it used to be like 7,800 cars a day versus 14,200, 14,300 on this end. And that's definitely higher. I mean, these numbers are years out of date. But that's higher because of, you know, old tip keeps growing up. And there's a lot of people that work in Springfield, so they're taking old tip and school road and different arterial roads to get to Springfield, but coming through Sherman. So if we can demonstrate this beautiful, nice park area, this great tip district area, um, and show that there's lots of people visiting it, and in this area, I think we have a better ability you know, like when we sit down and try to bring projects to the area to convince them, this is, look at how many people are walking this path. Now this playground. I'm getting texts from like people who live in Old Tip and just, everybody's, you've all seen it, right? There are tons of people that are playing on that playground and they're not all Sherman people. And it's a good thing, you know, some, some people may think it's bad, some people may think it's good. But if you think about it in terms of business creation, you're getting, you're bringing more people from around into that area which increases our chances of putting businesses in there and those businesses surviving and so that we don't have to increase our property tax levy and become a bigger piece of that pie on that property tax chart. So that's what we've always wanted to do is increase our business base instead of property taxes. So we gotta talk about if that activity expires, those revenues go away. So do we just do nothing with them or do we try to do a few more projects in that area and uh, you know, have some revenues that are sitting there in case somebody comes forward in the next year and a half. Like we can say, you know, okay, we're going to induce you this much to actually build that strip center or build that whatever it is. Um, but at the same time, there's enough revenues there right now, and we have a few other things that I think we need to do. And I hope everybody's on the same page. But we've talked about this in the past. We need to fence the area. We should fence the area. We've had a very good success at uh, growing our concerts, right? Businesses, first five years, I mean, if you're not moving up, and you've seen it. Everybody's worked it, everybody's been at them. So our concerts, our concert series and all that stuff, the amount of people that are visiting and then the word of mouth and the next concert and the next summer, and, you know, what, two years now, it just keeps growing. And, People are talking about it, and there's a lot more, there's more and more people coming out, right? So, if we can keep that momentum going, um, we'll be better in the end because of it. But it's been a burden on public works, and it's unsightly to continue to have the temporary fencing up. And if we have the temporary fencing up, and we have an aggressive uh, concert series schedule, the temporary fencing stays up all the time. It's not like it goes up, it goes down. So it's not really temporary, it's become permanent. And it's not, that's, it's unsightly, I think. And so what we need to do, what we should do, is, is fence that area so that we can control our access points for emission costs, right? Because that's what pays for, that's a huge cost offset for when we book the lights, the sound, and the bands. And then our uh, food and beverage sales offset that as well. But the door, the gate, is, is significant in getting a, a large portion of us back to where, back to even, and then making us money, right? And so, if we fence that area and we use these tip dollars, what was our estimate? And so we had Tim Smith, our architect, draw a very nice plan um, that we can essentially bid out. Um, we've talked to some fencing companies. That uh, fencing bid. If I remember, what was it, 77,000? It is anywhere from 70,000. So it's in the range of like, and that would be black rod iron, six foot tall, to match the current fencing essentially, or in, in concert with the fencing that's in that area with Old Tip and then the residents right on the other side of the road, like Perry Greeny and, um, you know, the black rod iron fence that's there. And it'll look very nice, right? But we should fence that, and then there's another aspect of it, is the playground is right there as well. So the fence plan would go the backside of the amphitheater, <coughs> down along the, the road, and then the, the playground sits there. You know, there's kids that are on the playground, and they run around and stuff like that, so it's a nice barrier for parents to not, you know, 
I know what parents do. They go sit on the benches, they scroll on their phones while their kids play, you know? So if you take your eyes off a kid for a second, the kid can be somewhere super fast. And so creating a, a fence barrier is good in that respect to keep those individuals in that area. They'll go up by the, the large pavilion, cut back, and then create a kind of curvature to follow the, uh, the berms that are located in front of the amphitheater. In it is also a nice decorative uh, some stone pillars, essentially, that match the pillars on the amphitheater, so keeping everything aesthetically pleasing and in, you know, in the same theme. And so, and then, you know, a nice entry that you would walk through, kind of like a promenade to go in, and where, you know, you know, Trusty Gray, Chief Banger, they always work the door, take the money, so people would walk through there, it'd be nice lighted, you know, it's a lighted path and everything like that. So that's what we need to, I, I hope we put in the budget, that's one thing. The other item that we talked about, a large attraction, would be the, well, I'm going to talk about a couple other things real fast. We're also going to relocate some of the large boulders down into that area. We've uh, intended on doing that for a long time now, but it takes a very, very large machine to pick those boulders and carry them down there. They weigh thousands and thousands of pounds. So there'll be like decorative uh, rock outcroppings in that area. They'll be serve a purpose to, you know, as like a barrier, another barrier just to stop anything that is in that area. We also have plans to put some bollards along the, the curve. This is more safety. We have uh, plans for a, uh, so here's another thing that we can do. It's pour some pavement behind the, uh, and just adjacent to the concession stand that's on this side. And what we can do with that is as we have these concerts, we can actually do like, if you remember Air Rendezvous, we can have like essentially chalets, VIP tents that businesses may want to rent. Rich Gatchenberger may want one. You know, building maintenance services, your, your son's business, great boy. Uh, Brian, you're, uh, you'll accept, you'll be bright. Christmas lights, you can, and then, so what we would do is we would charge, we'd charge, you know, the, the, or the business and be like a sponsorship essentially. Give the, that business, you know, access to this like VIP area. They would, you know, we'd stock it or whatever for a certain price. And then you could go out as a business and like take care of certain customers, you know, and then they would just free, you could give them an uh, entry to a concert and then you're supplying the drinks for them as the business and your customers feel like, you know, well, oh, wow, you know, why not, make, or uh, UCB's taking care of me, you know, something like along those lines. Um, but, you know, 10 by 10, 10 here, 10 by 10, you know, like that, and then that's the area that's kind of access control. So we could also put more revenues into the village, uh, coffers as well as we move forward. So there's, we need to pay some concrete there, and those TIF funds could actually be used to do that, and it would serve multiple things. I mean, we could have bags permits and stuff over there on that ground. Just, you just think outside the box, and there's a lot of uses for that. But with the tip, expiration of the TIF, that's why we're talking about it and trying, trying to get it in the budget. We need to act now and start getting some stuff done You know, this fall so we're not waiting until next year and you know, getting behind. Um, before I get to the big one, which is the splash pad, you have, what, where's my list? Um, what do we have for the tip side? Right now they're just hillsides and they slope. 
and they actually kind of wash them out as we come up. You know, it, it's an issue, especially right now with all of this rain, right? So we'll be over there washing mud and dirt off of the path. But I went over there. <laughs> I went over there. Like the roof down. <laughs> so Administrator Stratton and I had met over there a while back, and you know, he's like, "What do you want to do?" Well, else we talk about various different things. And the first thing that I saw was this. Let's cut this. Let's cut this hillside. Let's make it a retaining wall right there. That gives us a new flat area that basically extends playground, walk the path around the play, around the playground, and then uh, another flat area. And we can actually put benches, sell bin memorial benches, planters, tables, huh? additional tables, tables, all that stuff. So when you're over there with your kids, you know, you can sit and congregate and talk to other parents and you know, just picnic or do whatever. Um, but those retaining walls aren't cheap to put in, but they will look beautiful. They will enhance that area. It'll, it'll stand out like no other, and it'll serve an actual purpose. I mean, a function too that's holding back that hillside and it's stopping it from washing out. Oh my God! That's two nights in a row. Strike two. Tell me about it. Oh, 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 oh man, I'm ready for surgery. I'm ready for my next surgery. So if we do those retaining walls, like I said, it establishes another flat area for us to put the benches in and it allows more parents to watch their kids play, more parents, um, you know, to, to, to be in that area. Because it does get, you know, it gets a lot of people in there. But those, like I said, those walls are not cheap. And so, well, we got a bid, we got several bids. We had Hilltop come out, we had Greenview come out, and we had uh, Copper, Copper Tree. tree. Copper Tree came out the lowest. Kick up, and that's a good thing, right? Because yeah. $100,000 lower. Okay. So, uh, but Sherman Moog has been working with Copper Tree a lot. And so, in terms of, I'd have to look at the, the, the they came, there was a couple, both, I don't know Green View and Copper Tree had some pretty good designs, right? Okay. So that would be, would be good on the other one. Okay. But cost wise, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, another thing that we're going to have to actually do, I mean, we've talked about it and it has to be done, is, is put some nice, much like Washington Park did with that real good playground system that they have, we got to recognize our donors and our sponsors and our volunteers with, you know, the, the plaques and stuff, mm -hmm. right? And that needs to be a forever thing. Yeah. One of the things you can do is, yeah, no, with the popular Washington Park was papers. Yeah, papers are extremely popular. And then right, I'm, here, right now I'm talking about like we need to recognize the people that helped us build this park. I mean, we get we say tens and tens and tens of thousands of dollars. So, you know, whether it was getting the pond up for free, whether it was uh, you know the the carpenters and, the, and all the different you know tradesmen and stuff that put the playground in for nothing free, whether it was you know O'Shea that the uh, builders that stepped up and lended out their equipment and staff, our local resident Eric Knowles to go and shoot the elevations. There's a lot of the business and um, labor that came together on this project. We need to recognize that we need to you know do some of that nice stuff that's there forever. So people know, you know, how one of the components of why this park actually came about. So that's built into the budget. Um, the pillar entry, as I stated with the with the fencing and the designs in here. The, so this is a big thing that this wouldn't, we don't even make this decision right now. At a certain point, amphitheater lighting and sound, if we bought our own and did our own and had it in there, it's, it's a catch-22. The stuff changes, it needs, you know, a lot of labor goes into it, you gotta have a lot of you know, specialty in terms of having concerts and things along those lines, but potentially, if we wanted to look at buying our own sound and lighting, instead of, well, we'd still have to bring the technicians in to do it, but we, we would actually own the stuff instead of renting it for each concert and stuff. Um, so that's just a, a we'll briefly go over that. I talked about the VIP areas and the, uh, you know, kind of the chalets. If we were wanting to, and revenues were sufficient to do so, we've talked about it for a number of years, that's actually to bury those overhead lines that are out in front of there. 
to clean up that area and make it look so much nicer. And we had talked to Menard Electric years and years ago about doing that, and that's a possibility. And so that can be done next year. Um, we could budget for it this year, but thinking you know, about the long-term the long term plans for this park, if we're gonna bury those lines, now is the time to do it, because the, the revenues are available. And once it becomes a general revenue problem or issue, it's not happening. So if we wanna get those lines buried in the ground and make that area much cleaner and nicer and neater, now is the time to do it. The, uh, we're gonna to need to put some signage up at Village Park. We're gonna need some digital reader boards essentially to start advertising and announcing you know, the different things that are going on in there. And that's something that we could potentially use the revenues for as well. The, there's some various different Village Park projects that are just kind of almost miscellaneous in, in, in scope. Uh, I talked about the paved parking. Okay, so the two other big, large items that are outstanding. We're going to talk about one of them in executive session as well. But I'm going to touch on it in this public forum right now, just so everybody knows. Acquiring more ground next to the park. With the available revenues that we have in the TIF fund to try and capture more ground. And that would be whatever we could. So I've been talking with Mr. Sapp about them selling the village a portion of that ground or all of that ground. I don't know what my parameters are with the board and what everybody would support. Um, so we had the engineer, I, I had a meeting with uh, village council and the engineers and um, Administrator Stratton to kind of go over how much ground it is and what we could potentially offer and you know per acre and things along those lines. If we acquire the rest of the ground, I want you to think about this. Try and get the TIF extended, but if we also acquire the rest of the ground, in some facets, we would actually have that incentive at our disposal. And I say that meaning this. If we acquire that ground, we could either discount, and I'll just throw out a giveaway if it's a right project and a big enough sales tax generating project, we could give a portion, give a piece of land to a business that would come in and locate there, or like I said, discounted or whatever, um, at a much better per square footage rate than what they can buy it for out in the private market. So you would actually become the developer in some respects, but you would also, it's just like having an economic development incentive tool that you use through tax increment financing. So if we acquire ground, that's another way to, de to, to bring development to that area. So if we use our tip dollars now, we can do that for as many years into the future as we want, whether there's a tip or not, right? Which we still need that tip because it's gonna, we, we gotta get people to, to take a chance on Sherman and get, get those things churning dollars. The other thing is, is the splash pad. And we, had, we met with, uh, who was it? The no. no, uh, yeah. Well, we have designs the... for a splash pad. We have some numbers. I think together. it was the same company. That you talked to I want to send. I'm going to send it. So here's what, here's what I want. Here's my kind of my plan. I'm going to send that stuff to all of you tomorrow. I'm going to send the, the the color renderings and everything to all of you, and then I actually want to post it for the town to kind of see it. Maybe the following day or something. If you don't release it yourself, <laughs> don't leak it. Um, but. The splash pad obviously has a dollar associated with it. It would it would be pretty cool in terms of what we have come up with. And the theme of it, while a lot of splash pads have, you know, Southwind, nothing against Southwind, but it's basically just cool jets squirting you know, water like that. There's some that have palm trees and all this stuff. What we had talked to the individual about since there's an amphitheater, it's a concert area and all that stuff, is, and when you look down on it, you literally see it's kind of a silhouette of a guitar. 
And then the items that are spraying water and stuff, the guitar and saxophone and all that stuff, the singing roll is like literally looks like piano keys and stuff. You see it in the designs. It's pretty cool. But a splash pad, a splash park in that area, I think would be very well received and it'll bring patrons and people to that area and it'll increase our chances for economic development immensely. And like I said, going back to the economic development, if we can bring business generated sales into this town, we're going to be much better off and it allows us to keep the property tax levy super tight, super low. So, um, I know that's a lot to digest. Everybody's listening to me very patiently for quite a while now. But uh, uh, is there any discussion that you guys want to talk about some of these projects? Anybody have any thoughts or any other things or other items that you may uh, potentially think would be great for that area and enhance it and bring uh, and bring you know a better opportunity for economic development. Anybody? Yep. And that would be uh, if we do acquire additional land, which we should acquire work to acquire more land anyway, just south of it. You know no matter what, and that could be used for more additional parking as well. Yeah. What about to the east, closer to uh, business, right there, turn a bullet over, whatever you call that over there. The green space, that, the the green space that we use right now? Well, I mean, if, you, if we pay you that, it's going to take away from the, the openness. I mean, it's definitely a great, thought because yeah we would need more parking right um so then it begs the question of where does the parking go and how much of that do you pay and we can actually put together some design have some designs put together because that's a good thought but you uh, put trees out there right well, first yeah yeah because yep. yep. initially we always talked about putting a little hall out there mm -hmm. but it's so nice to see the park not obstructed and the amphitheater not obstructed by a and we talked about, and we have worked with the, uh, the owner of the rail, potentially acquire that back triangle behind the amphitheater. And so I have a number on that stuff that when we go into executive session, we'll kind of talk about that as well. And we've already been apprised of that in the past, but there's a lot of moving parts going on right now regarding <coughs> land acquisition and how they're going to play into our budget. But I need to kind of get together with all of you to figure out what you're supportive of and how far um, you know, I can go in terms of sitting down and doing these negotiations. So, anybody else have? One of my main concerns is maintenance. Mm -hmm. A lot of the stuff. I mean, we've talked about our guys that are working hard, our parks, <coughs> all the parks where the extensions are up and all that. I mean, yeah, it's great we've got the money, but we're going to have two, three years down the line and we need more help. Yep. Maintenance is a big thing. Yeah, I, mean, we, I think we kind of forget about it. And so, yeah, and so that's a very good question too. So, uh, getting going a little bit even more deeper into the, into the weeds. So, implementing reservations of, say, the pavilions that are in the jungle park. We're getting tons of requests for reservations and people wanting to book that for the simple fact that you know, there's a great playground there, whether you're going to have a birthday party, family reunion, you name it. So we're going to generate sales uh, and revenues that are going to help our budget and provide for you know the staff, the headcount, and the equipment that we need to, to maintain that. The other plan that we've kind of talked about and hit on a little bit last night is, is opening up the concession stand for the Sons Under Health kids in there. The fact that there's parents and kids and grandparents and all of these individuals in that area, you get thirsty, you get hungry. And if there's a ring pop or a Snickers bar close, you're tugging on your mom's leg or your dad's, dad's leg and you're going and asking for that. And so we'll set, you know, uh, set that up to actually have a concession stand that generates revenues in that, in, in that respect. Um, the concerts, again, as they continue to go up, <coughs> you know, we have a cover charge and we, you know, make money on those and dial it in or we're still in our infancy we're only two years into it 
those dollars that we make from bringing patrons in and you know from beverage sales, I'll say that because there's kids in the room, uh, beverage and food and sales and things along those lines will also go in to help offset the, the cost of having the park, right? So those are the, some of the things that you know will actually help defer and help assist in the maintenance of that of that area. But yeah, that's a definite valid concern, and we always have to be looking at that. Can any of this money go towards Club Works new building? What's that? Club Works building? No, no. I Only mean, if it was situated within the TIF district, and we don't have a spot for a Club Works facility. But I do have. Some things I'm going to tell you about um, in the executive session regarding some, you know land acquisition and some various different options that now are there that could help with that. And then I also I told you last night that you know we we also have some land right now that we could potentially sell the uh, backfill of some of the revenues to uh, help with the purchase of ground and you know. The ongoing plan for a new public works facility. Any other questions? So we've covered a lot of ground in the last few months. Time as it is, it is bumping up right at the six o'clock hour. Do you feel inclined to adjourn this meeting and just handle further budget talks at the next? scheduled meeting for next Tuesday the 28th, or would you like me to recess this meeting, we'll do a, go into session for our regular meeting, and then we can come back this evening after the regular meeting ends and touch on anything that we may have not gotten to since it, we are at the six o'clock hour? I'm gonna recess it, or do you wanna adjourn it? And even if we recess it, we can still make the decision at the end of this next meeting to, but if, if we adjourn it, then we can't go back in and we can't talk as a public, we can't, all of us can't talk again. So why don't we just re recess it, see how this meeting goes essentially, how long it goes, and then we can potentially do some more work this evening. Okay, yeah, I'm sorry. Okay, so I had opened the public hearing on the tentative budget for the appropriations ordinance commencing May 1st through 2020. Uh, that through April 30th of 2021. Now, uh, statutorily, I want to go to public comment as posted on the agenda. Let's see if there's anybody seeking recognition and allow them to comment to the village board for the... Did you want to for okay. Okay, uh, we have one individual who signed in and wanted to, to, or to speak to the board, uh, Mrs. Uh, Sandy Walden. So you already know, three minutes is the board policy for speaking, and I'll set the timer, but go ahead and start. Um, my only concern with this budget is the fact that you, with all the discussion of the income, loss and in income in this budget because of the COVID-19 and all the effects that it's having on it, that your, um, you're estimating over a half million dollar deficit in this budget, and the fact that it includes 1.38 million, almost 1.4 million dollars in capital outlay projects, and, and I think if anything, it would be advantageous to not go overboard in capital outlay this year and put a hold on that, because if you're anticipating a shortfall in revenues and you're anticipating a, a over five, $100,000 deficit in this budget, then I would, I mean, you're trying to find little bitty pieces here and there of where to cut, and that's not enough. And capital outlay would clearly be enough to make this budget whole. Yep. That's my concern as a citizen. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Walden. And again, we kind of talked about that last evening. We talked about whether we'll dip into our reserves as we have sufficient reserves and uh, whether we would seek bonding for various different projects and all those different avenues that are available to the to the, to the board. Um, it's not a final budget, but that's what we're doing 
you know, that's what we had a four hour meeting for last night. That's why we've already had one, another hour meeting this evening, um, and potentially even longer at the conclusion of uh, this meeting. So that being said, thank you for your comments, Ms. Walton. Uh, if there's no further business to come before, actually, nope, I'm just gonna uh, recess the, uh, the meeting, uh, the, the public hearing of the Sherman Village Board of Trustees for the fiscal year 2021 budget. So the, that meeting will stand recessed and the time is 6.02.